We're now going to look at the most difficult concept in kinship and marriage, that is dissent. Dissent refers to the ideas concerned with how we are related to each other. We live in a particular system, but most other societies don't abide by this, and it's essential before moving on to any of the other subjects in anthropology of marriage to understand dissent. To understand such remarks as that made by a Nua, described by Evans Pritchard, who said of their uncle, their mother's brother, that he is both father and mother, but most frequently he is your mother. Now how can people say he is your mother? What does dissent, in other words, mean? The anthropologist W.H. Rivers distinguish between three forms of transmission which are important to distinguish. There is the transmission of property, which we call inheritance. There is the transmission of an office, such as kingship, which is known as succession. And then there is the transmission of the right of belonging to a group of kin. And that kin group membership, when transmitted, is known as descent. So Rivers wrote, whenever I use this term, it will apply to membership of a group and to this only. When you're talking, therefore, about descent, you're talking about how people classify their relatives and how they are conceiving of themselves as related to others in superior generations. The principles of descent organize most societies in the past and in the third world. As Radcliffe Brown put it, in the absence of weak development of political structure, dissent through one line gives an effective system of social integration, makes it, it possible to create corporate kin groups which have continuity in time extending beyond the life of an individual or a family. Corporate kin groups tend to become the most important feature of social structure. It's first of all essential to distinguish between descent, which is a social relationship, and the biological link that one has with parents. The biological link is a physical genetic blood link which one has, for example, with one's parents and one's grandparents. But the social link is a perceived relationship. Let us look at this in three different cases. In our own society, we conceive of ourselves as related to our father by blood, and by a social link. He is one of our kin group. Likewise, we consider our mother to be related to us in these two ways. But this, in fact, historically is a minority view. The majority of societies don't look at it this way. Those which anthropologists call patrilineal, or more recently, agnatic societies, for example, the Nua themselves, or the Bunyoro, or the Swazi of South Africa, conceive of a biological link between the children and the mother and the father. But the social relationship, or the social link, which forms on which basis they form their social groups, is only through the males. Descent, in other words, runs through males. This leads to all sorts of rather bizarre situations which have been described by Evans Pritchard, among others. For example, you can have what is known as ghost marriage. Traditionally, we're told among the Nua, if a man died unmarried, his brother might arrange a marriage between a woman and the dead man. The social father was dead, but he became he passed on that social link, even though dead. The children of the woman inherit as children of the dead man. In what is termed ghost marriage, the live brother acts as the pro-husband to the woman. He may actually genetically procreate the child, but the social father is the dead man. Thus you distinguish between the genitor, that is the person who does the procreation, and the pater, that is the social father. Again, in a more extreme case, the father, that is the social father, may not even be male. You may get a social father who is a female. 
The custom of marriage between two women illustrates this distinction between uh, biological and social. For example, John Barnes describes how among the patrilineal Zulu and among the Nua, when an eminent man dies, leaving a daughter but no sons, the daughter sometimes marries another woman and thereby acquires rights to her as a mother. The female husband is the pater, the social father, of the children born by her wife, and they belong to the pater's patrilineage, which I'll describe. Thus, her father's agnatic line is perpetuated and his ancestral wrath is avoided. Thus, we see a sort of Alice in Wonderland situation to us, where fathers can be female, where dead husbands produce children, and so on. One of the triumphs of anthropology is to show how what at first sight looks very illogical is in fact has its own inner logic. The third example, I've shown something of an agnatic system, is the what is known as a matrilineal, that is through the mother, or better, uterine through the womb, uterus, societies. For example, the Trobrians described by um, Malinowski, or the South Indian Nayars and other societies. In this society, which is the extreme, both biological and social links are through women. And as Malinowski superbly documented for the Trobrians, the father is merely a, um, a man living with the mother. It's very difficult, of course, in agnatic societies to omit the fact that you are genetically related to your mother. This is so self-evidently obvious from childbirth. But it is possible, if you believe that the strong social bond is with your mother and her group, to forget or almost entirely overlook the relationship with your father. And thus Malinowski describes in his Sexual Life of Savages, the idea that it is solely and exclusively the mother who builds up the child's body, the man in no way contributing to its formation, is the most important factor in the legal system of the Trobrianders. Between the father and the child, there is no bond of physical union whatsoever. Social position is handed on in the mother line, from a man to his sister's children, and this exclusively matrilineal conception of kinship is of paramount importance. These natives have a well-established institution of marriage, and yet are quite ignorant of the man's share in the begetting of children. At the same time, the father has for the Trobrianders a clear, though exclusively social, definition. It signifies the man married to the mother, who lives in the same house with her and forms part of the household, but who is ultimately a stranger. Now this idea is not so unfamiliar to us in reverse, in the idea of virgin birth, for example, in the Christian myths, where the mother, in fact, has very little relationship with the infant Jesus. And in that case, it's reversed. And we do have now in our social system many examples of people who are living in houses with someone who is not genetically their father, who is just in the household at the time. So it's important to distinguish between biological and social descent. And societies, in fact, tend to adopt one of three ways of tracing descent. These ways can be summarized as follows. First of all, you have to make a distinction between those societies which trace descent either through one line, emphasizing male or female, and these are known as unilineal systems, or societies, on the other hand, which trace it through two lines, which are known as bilineal systems. If you look at all human societies, the majority of them are unilineal. We happen not to be, but most societies historically and ethnographically have been unilineal. They've traced it through one line or the other. 60% of a world sample of about 450 societies, which was looked at by a man called Murdoch, were unilineal. Of these, the majority are agnatic, that is, they trace it through males. 75% are agnatic, 20% are 
matrilineal or uterine, and the others, small percentage, have all sorts of bizarre systems. Sometimes they're known as utrilateral, that is you can choose whether you want to be related through males or females. Others have an alternating descent system. A son will take his descent group from his mother, a daughter from the father, and so you get all sorts of complicated systems, sometimes known as ropes, rather like DNA chains, where the descent system is wrapping itself round its, itself. All these different systems exist, but the majority are patrilineal or matrilineal. We, in fact, historically are in the minority. When you have unilineal descent, and it's to unilineal descent I now want to turn, this enables a society to form a group, that is all the relatives who are linked through males or females. And these groups are known as unilineal descent groups. The short terms are UDGs. These groups are the building blocks of many traditional societies. As Radcliffe Brown put it, in many societies the kinship system also includes a structure by which the whole society is divided into a number of separate groups, each consisting of a body of persons who are, or who regard themselves, as being a unilineal body of kindred. Now these unilineal descent groups, which can be ba based on either male or female descent, form into groups who are kin, and to this the word uh, which has been used is lineage. It's not the same, it comes from the French word lineage, but it's rather different from the French meaning. A lineage is defined as a consanguineal, that's through blood, kin group practicing unilineal descent, which includes only persons who can actually trace their relationship to a common ancestor. That is, a lineage is all the unilineal descendants of a known common ancestor or ancestress. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean a group of people who live together. Lineage, lineages can be dispersed. The newer lineages, for example, are not in all living in one place. They are frequently associated over a wide territory. Nor does it necessarily mean that they all own property together. At least not property in the normal sense. There is usually some sort of corporate existence in the, in ownership, but it needn't be land or cattle. For example, the Yanomama Indians of South America were told there land has nothing to do with the functions of the corporate group. Women and rights to dispose of women in marriage constitute the estate of the Yanomama corporate groups. So you have local descent groups who have a share in the women. The outstanding features of lineages are the following. You must be able to trace your link to all the other members directly. You must know that this person is related to you. You mustn't marry within the lineage. It is exogamous, as the term goes. And finally, many political, religious and economic rights belong to the group and not to the individual members. It's rather like an Oxford or Cambridge college in which the wine, the grass in front of the uh, college buildings, the silver, belongs to the college and if any individual member decides to start taking the silver off to his private dinner parties he will be in trouble. So you have corporate property belonging to a fellowship or in this case to a unilineal descent group. In such a society, for example the Nayoro of Africa, one's father's brother is a member of one's own group while a mother's brother is a member of an entirely different group Imagine if we had our two uncles in entirely different groups. Now, what kinds uh, types of line lineage does one have? Well, basically one has them based on descent through males, which are known as patrilineages, or through females, which are known as matrilineages. And these lineages tend to break down into smaller units. The other form of group one has are known as clans. A clan, which is taken from the Scottish and Irish word, is usually larger than a lineage. It's a whole set of different lineages who are joined together. It's defined as a group of persons of both sexes, 
membership of which is determined by unilineal descent, actual or putative. Now, the important thing about a clan is that you may not actually know how Mr. McFarlane, who you happen to meet in the street, is related to you, but you know that he belongs to Clan McFarlane, and therefore you are all of the same clan. In such a society, uh, each member can actually, or at least theoretically, trace a relationship. But you can't always do it in practice. In such societies, which are based on unilineal descent, you tend to get the society breaking down into groups and smaller and smaller groups. It structures the whole society. What it tends to happen is that the large group breaks, or as it's known, segments, and these are societies which have are therefore described as segmentary structures, they segment into smaller and smaller groups. So you will have, taking the example of the Gusai people of Kenya, just east of Lake Victoria, you have a tribe, which is the whole society, who are all descended from an ancestor. These tribes are then broken into clans, which are patrilineal segments, marrying out of each clan and politically autonomous. They occupy discrete territories and you use kinship terms within such groups. These are your clan mates and if you happen to want to fight with them, you fight with clubs rather than with spears because they are relatives even if you can't quite trace the link. You then have sub-clans and then you have the sub-clans breaking into lineage segments, lineages, then you have the lineages breaking, segmenting into large families, polygynous families, that is, one man with several different families, each from a different wife, and then these break down into nuclear families. And in such a society, you can therefore see, rather like a bureaucratic organization, it breaks into smaller and smaller groups. And in such a society, dissent holds the whole thing together.